Suppose we want to compose the sine function with the inverse sine function. Let's recall the domain and the range of both of these firsts. So let me call the sine function f. So f of x equals sine of x. Now to make sure that this had an inverse, we had to make sure it was one to one so that we restricted the domain between negative pi over two and pi over two. The range of sine is just the regular range of sine from negative one to one. So then as inverse, the inverse sine of x is going to flip-flop these domain and ranges. So the domain of f becomes the range of the inverse. And the range of f becomes the domain. Okay, this is important to do because when I go to compose them, I have to make sure the function is defined. So let's do f composed with the inverse. So just doing a simple substitution, this means f of the inverse, sine of x. So then placing that inverse sine as my input into f, we would have sine of inverse sine of x. So since these are inverses, they would just undo each other, giving me back x, as long as the domain is satisfied within that inverse. In other words, that x has to be in the domain of the inverse, which is between negative 1 and 1. Okay, if I go the other way, f inverse composed with f. This time, the input will be sine of x. So then I have inverse sine of sine of x. Since these are inverses, they would undo each other. So I would be left with x, as long as sine of x is defined within how we had our restriction. So this x is the domain of sine, which is the angle restriction, which is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, so we can do these compositions as long as these domains are satisfied. So let's do a few examples doing composition. So let's say I have the inverse sine of sine of pi over 10. So this will be true as long as pi over 10 is in the domain of sine. So the angle restriction that we put on sine is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So as long as pi over 10 is between there, then we're good to go. So ignore the pi just for a second. So think of this as 1 tenth being less than 1 half. So 1 tenth of a pi is in fact less than a half of a pi. So this is satisfied. So this was the correct answer. Okay, let's go the other way. Let's say I have the sine of the inverse sine of 1. Let's do negative 1 third. This would be nice. I'm just going to put a question mark if this were negative one third. But they would just undo each other. But this is only true if the domain is satisfied. So since we're talking about the inverse sine, the domain is the range of sine, which is negative one to one. So as long as negative one third is between negative one and one, which it is, then they do in fact undo each other and we get negative one third. Let's do another one like that. Let's say we have the sine of the inverse sine of pi. Again, this would be really nice if they just undid and we're left with pi and the question mark. So we have to look at the domain of the inverse sine. The domain of the inverse sine is the range of sine, which is from negative 1 to 1. And pi, which is about 3.14, is not between negative 1 and 1. So this is not true. So that equation is not true. This middle part, the inverse sine of pi, that does not exist. So the composition also will not yield anything. It does not exist. Right, let's do one more. This one's going to be a little tough. 
go back to an inverse composed with a sine. So the inverse sine composed with sine. Let's say of 11 pi over 9. Again, this would be really nice if they just simply undid each other. We were left with the input of 11 pi over 9. And this will be true as long as our domain is satisfied. So we're taking sine of an angle. So this is our angle restriction, which was between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So if I do 11 pi over 9 between there, you'll see this is not true because 11 ninths much, much more than 1 half. So this is not true. But that doesn't mean that this, it, this composition is not, uh, does not exist. This actually means we have to do something a little clever here. 11 pi over 9 is an angle. So that means I can move this angle to make the restriction satisfied. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let me draw that angle, 11 pi over 9. So 9 goes into 11, a little more than 1. Two ninths left over. So somewhere in the third quadrant, somewhere. Okay, so that's the original angle. You can see immediately this is not in our restriction because sine is restricted between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So what I'm going to do is move this angle to be either in the first or the fourth quadrant. Now what I need to do is keep the sine the same. So we need to keep sine the same. So since we're talking about sine, we're talking about the y-coordinate. So I'm going to redraw this angle so that all the y's are the same. So in other words, I'm just going to reflect it over the y-axis. Okay, so any point on the terminal side of the angle 11 pi over 9 will give us negative x, negative y. And then any point on the terminal side of this other angle will give us x negative y. So notice the sine value is going to be exactly the same. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So now what I need to do is figure out what is this angle from the standard position, so from the positive x-axis. I need to know what is that angle. So if you look at the other angle, They would actually be the same. So this gets us back to reference angles. So again, 11 pi over 9 is 2 and 2 ninths, or 1 and 2 ninths pi. So 1 full pi and then 2 ninths of a pi. So 2 ninths pi is our reference angle. So on the other side, going from standard position, it would be negative 2 pi over 9. Again, the y coordinate would be the same. So this means that sine of 11 pi over 9 equals sine of negative 2 pi over 9. We get the same thing. So now what I can do is a little substitution back in the original question. And this now becomes the inverse sine of sine. Replace the first part of this now with the second part. Now the domain is satisfied. Now they undo each other. Now we have our answer.